Hi everyone, welcome to Mujeres Power Talk Women's Business Series, and we're going to talk about transformation in 2021. It's a pleasure for me to talk about Latina women in business and commemorate Women's History Month. I'm Vivian Medina Messner, Assistant Professor and VCU Home Scholar at Virginia Commonwealth University, and I'm with the Robertson School of Media and Culture. Welcome. And as we think about honoring the contributions of Hispanics, Latinos, and Latinx, I want to take a moment to uh, talk about these terms. So Hispanics are people whose heritage are mostly from Spain or a Spanish-speaking country, and Latinos are people whose heritage are from South America and in general Latin America. And Latinx is a term that is a non-gender neutral term um, that it's becoming more and more popular, especially with the younger generations. Now, it's a little controversial in the sense that some uh, purists with the Spanish language are still debating whether or not uh, it should be included as a term to include the plurals non-gender. So as we think about honoring the contributions of Hispanics, Latinos, and Latinx, past and present in building the United States. I also want to highlight that recently um, Congress passed legislation to create the Smithsonian National Museum of American Latino in DC. So the American Latino Act HR 2420, which will create the museum on the National Mall dedicated to commemorating over 500 years of American Latino contributions to the nation's military, sciences, business, civil rights, media, and the art. So it's a very exciting time um, to celebrate and honor the different contributions. Now, also, when we think about the history of Latino business in the United States, we look back in history in the, in the 19th century, where many Latino businesses first concentrated in the South western portion of the United States and of course there was a strong Mexican and Mexican-American uh, influence. It included ranchers, farmers, land colonizers, store operators, street vendors, real estate developers. Now there were also concentrations of different Latino and Latino businesses in the eastern states such as New York and Florida, of course with this Latin American and Caribbean merchants. As we think about the role of Latina women in business, we also have to stop and think about that the U.S. Latino communities grew, and of course, women were part of managing those small, family-owned businesses that met the everyday life needs of growing populations. They worked with their families and with their communities. Now, I also would like to take a moment to highlight the history of Latina women in business. And this is a great example of an entrepreneur. Victoria Hernandez, an Afro Puerto Rican woman, she was a music entrepreneur. She migrated from Puerto Rico to New York City following the end of World War I. Victoria Hernandez was an accomplished violinist, a cellist, a pianist, but she dedicated herself mostly to the business aspect of the industry. And of course, at the time, it was more prestigious to be involved in the business aspect of the industry than actually to be a woman musician. But she also worked as a seamstress in a factory and taught embroidery to the daughters of Cuban families. And so, like many uh, small business and entrepreneurs, Victoria, in 1927, she bought a storefront for $500 and she opened Almacenes Hernandez or the Hernandez Music Store. Now, Victoria Hernandez is credited with opening the first Puerto Rican-owned music store in New York City. And here you have some pictures. Now, as we think also of the role of Latina women in business, we have to go back to the 1920s where many Puerto Rican women and other women of different communities worked as part of the garment industry's labor force in the U.S. and in particular in New York. And as you can see in some of the pictures here, um, there was also a lot of movement 
towards supporting women's rights and creating transformation for women. As we commemorate the Women's History Month, in 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified. And it was a very exciting time because on November 2nd of that year, more than 8 million women across the United States voted in elections for the first time. And as you can see here, highlighted in this article, Hispanic and Latina women joined forces across the country with other women in support of the 19th Amendment that granted women the right to vote. So Hispanic women and Latina women were very much part of that, of that movement to create transformation and to support the women's right to vote in the United States. Now, also as we travel through time and we think about the contributions of women in, in the labor force and business and also highlighting Women's History Month, we all share family stories of immigrants coming to the United States. And we have to think about Latina and Hispanic women supporting the U.S. economy on many different levels. So here I like to share some pictures of my own family in my own immigrant story. So here, there's a picture of my Aunt Marina and my mother, Lenore, in Bogota, Colombia, during the 1960s before moving to the United States. And here, at the bottom of the right side, you have my mother, Lenore, during lunch break at work in the Garmin District, or also known the Fashion District, in New York City during the early 60s. So as you can see, we, many of us share uh, family stories of immigrants coming to the United States and supporting the U.S. economy on different levels. It's also important to highlight that in general Latina women in the United States but also Latina owned businesses in the United States before the impact of COVID-19 and this pandemic, especially in 2019, there was a record-breaking year for Latino entrepreneurs. Latina owned businesses grew by 34% over the past 10 years, and many news outlets such as CNBC reported that average annual revenue of Hispanic-owned businesses increased by 10% to over $500,000 yearly. Another point is that credit scores at the time among Latino entrepreneurs rose from an average of 500 to 600 points. So it was a very successful time from, for um, Latina-owned businesses and Latina women in business. Now moving fast forward, while we still have uh, many renowned boss Latinas, like here an example, Sofia Vergara, Colombian uh, entrepreneur. She co-founded Latin World Entertainment, and many of you probably know her from different shows in the United States and different movies. It's important to also highlight that during this pandemic, the Latina-owned businesses have been suffering a great impact due to this pandemic. And some challenges have emerged because, as you can see in this article, many Latino uh, businesses and Latina women in business are looking at some bank loan rejections. But this is also an opportunity for Latina women entrepreneurs to find new funding sources to work with the SBA and the Virginia Hispanic Chamber and the Virginia Hispanic Foundation. Hola, bienvenidos, and welcome to the Virginia Hispanic Chamber, and we're proud to present our Mujeres Power Talk Women's Business Series, Transformation in 2021. So I'm Lisa Zazier, the Executive Director of the Educational Programs for the Virginia Hispanic Foundation. Today, we'll hear from successful Latinas that are dominating, breaking the mold, and showcasing their transformational leadership in 2021. And they're gonna share their real life stories with us today, which makes it so more meaningful and personal and from the heart. And you know how they overcame obstacles to achieve these goals. So our goal in hosting Mujeres Power Talk series is like to come together and share our personal stories with each other so that we have know that we all have more in common than not and we're not alone. 
And especially now, we don't want to be alone. So we thank everyone for being here. And I would like to go ahead and pass it over to Sandra. Thank you, Lisa. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Sandra Felipe, and I work with the Virginia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Virginia Hispanic Foundation. And we thank everyone for being here today. Uh, as I was telling Lisa, it's important for the Virginia Hispanic Foundation to, to enhance and highlight these stories of with powerful women that we have today to share their story and especially inspire others and help others to come up the ladder. Um, and with that say, Lisa, I will turn it off to you and it's a pleasure to be here today. All right, great. Thank you, Sandra. Well, I have the great pleasure of introducing my very good friend, Jeanette Pranger. And Jeanette is Jeanette Hernandez Pranger. So that is her full name. She is founder and CEO of and president of the the wonderful eco select company and um, i have known jeanette for years and she is such a strong strong latina leader she leads one of the top 500 hispanic businesses in the country and with more than 300 employees serving clients nationwide in canada and in canada and so she, the talent as the talent behind the technology eco select is a talent acquisition and advisory consulting company specializing in providing people, process, and technology solutions for its clients. Jeanette started her career as a software developer and was promoted into various management positions during her experience at leading companies such as Sprint, TWA, Federal Reserve Bank, and Wall, Dell, and Reed. So in 1995, Jeanette founded EcoSelect, and I think that's maybe when we met. <laughs> it's been a long time with um, one client, and it has grown into a leading provider of technology talent for Fortune 100 companies and government agencies with offices in Kansas City and Washington, D.C. So I, you know, I can't say enough about you, Jeanette, you just are one of the most amazing women I think that I know, and I've always valued and respected you, and you have served on so many national boards um, um, across the country over the years, and, and sometimes wherever I go, I would always see you, <laughs> and, and, and it was just so fun always connecting with you, and I would just love for you um, right now to share your personal story, if you would, including like the path you followed to success, and maybe some clues you noticed along the way that, that helped you to transform into this dynamic a leader that you are. Well, thank you, Lisa. And I feel very honored and privileged to be with these other amazing women, as well as yourself, um, to talk to women and others uh, from the Virginia Hispanic Chamber about being a Latina entrepreneur. I am kind of uh, what I like to call an accidental entrepreneur. My uh, mother is Portuguese, was Portuguese. I was born in a group of islands called the Azores Islands off the coast of Portugal. She was a studying to be a teacher. She met my Mexican father who was listed, enlisted in the Air Force and was based there. Um, and the, when I do press my father as to what part of Mexico they come from, it's, he says Northern, Northern Mexico, and it's actually San Antonio, Texas. So uh, the border crossed them. But my, um, my parents were amazing. They valued education. Uh, we traveled quite a bit because my father worked for TWA. And from the time it was very formative years, my earliest years, uh, earliest memories were in Mallorca, Spain. And when we lived on the East Coast, I really um, was so blessed because I lived in a neighborhood where the people across the street were Greek and on either side of us, they were Italian and Jewish. And it was just uh, so such a diverse neighborhood. Everybody had someone in their family that spoke with an accent. And I think we can relate to those that come from a different country to make it in the United States. Um, we were relocated to Kansas City, Missouri because of my father's job. And he's the reason why I'm in technology, um, having a hard time choosing a major and not having much of an imagination. And he told me that I should major in this field, an evolving field. And in 1980, I was one of three women majoring in that field at my university. 
Um, I did marry my husband after my sophomore year in college. I had one child my junior year in college. I had another child my senior year in college during an internship. And um, we are now blessed after 40 years of marriage to, or, to have or two boys and six grandchildren and two amazing daughter-in-laws. But it, that journey has been very difficult and diverse at times. Moving to Kansas City was a culture shock um, because my mother was Portuguese. I was used to Portuguese foods and, um, you know, there was a lot of, at that time, ignorance about speaking other languages. People made fun of my mother's accent, not being able to understand her. I would have to translate. Um, my parents were very wise in just saying, your job is to be a student, stay focused, be nice to people. And then when they get to know you, they will appreciate you. And sooner or later, it happened. You have people that like you for who you are. And that's kind of transpired, not only through my friendships, but also in business. Um, I majored in technology. I My first job, you mentioned Lisa, was as a programmer and I was promoted into management. And in mid 95, there was a, this new technology that everybody had been talking about, the internet, in my company, we put in, we implemented an intranet and my group put in a repository. It was a lot of new technology, but I had to hire people to help us understand and implement. And one of my employees came to me and said, why are you not doing this? And this is what I do today. Echo Select was originally elite computer consultants um, in the mid nineties. And we shortened the name to uh, Echo. It was just easier. I don't have, again, a lot of imagination, but as the marketing person, I did the elite computer consultant so that our name appeared alphabetically in the telephone book. Uh, so it was one of the first ones. So the uh, select part came later when the, we were looking for a domain name and Echo was already taken. And so Folger Select meant cream of the crop coffee. So we were cream of the crop and finding talent. We have offices in Kansas City, Washington, DC. And actually, as of last year, we as of last week, we have over 400 consultants around the country. So I'm very proud of the team. We have an amazing culture, but we constantly question how we work. Is it effective? Is it efficient? Can we improve ourselves, not just professionally, but also personally? And I, I can't wait to hear the stories of these other amazing women. Thanks, Jeanette. Thank you so much. Sandra, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Jeanette. What a wonderful story. Um, I, I, I'm anxious to learn more about Maria and Jennifer as well. But let me introduce our second speaker, Maria Tamburi. She's the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Dominion Energy and is responsible for leading Dominion's energy diversity and inclusion and employee engagement programs. Previously, Maria was Senior Community Engagement Policy Director, and in this role, she led the company's community engagement efforts across Dominion Energy's footprint. Prior to her current job, Maria held a variety of roles, which include a political appointee in the administration of President George W. Bush. Her time in the administration provided her with the opportunity to work as a senior advisor for public diplomacy and public affairs at the Department of State's Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs and Director of Specialty Media and Hispanic spokesperson in the White House Office of Media Affairs. What a great experience, Maria. Maria is a graduate of Florida International University in Miami, Florida where she earned her bachelor's degree in political science. She, saw, she also studied Latin American politics at the University of Belgrano in her native city of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Maria, that's a wonderful story as well. And with that, I would like to turn it over to you and for you to share our personal story. Thank you so much. And I am so excited to be here, um, not only um, with just such amazing women, and I cannot wait to hear more. And Lisa and Sandra, thank you so much. And to the Virginia Hispanic Chamber, thank you for being partners with us. Thank you for being a partner with our communities, with Dominion Energy. I, I really appreciate so much everything you all do every day for the 
Hispanic community here in Virginia. Um, so I, so my background, um, you know, it's interesting when we started this conversation uh, and Jeanette, uh, you know, I hear your story and, and, and we briefly had a conversation when I also read Jennifer's and we have so many things in common, which I think it's wonderful. Um, but my, my background, I'm, I'm originally, as I said, from Argentina, Buenos Aires. Um, I came to the United States when I was eight years old and um, we came to the United States like many other immigrants kind of fleeing um, our home countries because either political turmoil or, you know, economic uncertainty. Um, so my parents decided just to, you know, pretty much put whatever we could on suitcases, leave our family behind and start a new life. Um, and that came with some challenges as a lot of our, you know, community um, faces today um, in, in the United States and, and, and around the world. Um, you know, being an immigrant kind of gives you that perspective of, you know, you can do it. Um, you, you know, you overcome, overcome obstacles every single day. And I saw my parents, you know, leaving Argentina where we had, you know, a life that was, you know, we, we had family, we had a support mechanism, we, you know, my parents spoke the language and my sister and I as well to really come to a new country that embraced us, but we didn't know the language. We didn't understand the culture and it was really, everything was new. Um, my parents worked really hard to, but one of the lessons, well, one of them, and there's many lessons that I really took was, you know, you gotta go to school. You have to have a career. You have to make it. And you have to be nimble. You have to be, you know, be able to adapt to change because change will happen when you least expect it. And as we have been living the last year, um, I think that has been pretty much um, a change that none of us, I think no, no one in the world expected a global pandemic. But um, those are the kind of things that my parents always kind of taught us. Um, so I decided after um, you know, a few years when I went to college and worked full time while I was going to school that I wanted to just continue and, and learn more about politics. Um, I, I, I grew up in a very um, interesting political environment in Argentina and I just wanted to learn more. Um, so I, I, I majored in political science and um, one of the turning points that I would say in my life was coming, going to Washington DC for um, a Washington semester program at American University. Um, I, during that time, I was interning in the House Judiciary Committee during the impeachment trial of President Clinton and they hired me for the summer and then I got hired by another committee and I never left DC. Um, and, and, and sort of that was my, his, my story. I think it was, you know, many times in your life you say timing um, is everything. And I think for me, there were some very particular moments where I, the timing was right. And I was able because of hard work, perseverance, commitment, and really, wanting to um, achieve a career in the political realm, that it really opened these doors for me. Um, and, 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 and that was sort of my, you know, the, the turning point in my career. Um, in, in, in the last, I would say 10 years, I've gotten the opportunity to obviously work at the White House with President Bush, which was just an incredible, incredible experience. I just working in his administration for eight years gave me just experiences that, you know, I, I it, just so many of them that till today I kind of like pinched myself and I was like, I can't believe I got to, you know, sit next to the president in a meeting or be able to brief him. Um, and those were just incredible experience. But then, you know, afterwards living overseas, um, been able to live in Germany um, with my husband, and um, I have two beautiful young girls that were live that were born in Germany, and um, and then later on, really deciding to you know switch my career and and move into the private sector, which has been an incredible experience. 
um, looking from a government side and been able to input all my, my experience in policy and international affairs in um, national security and kind of bringing all that experience and bringing it to the private sector and helping companies like Dominion Energy tackle some of the issues that we deal with today. Um, in my role today as you know, the Director of Diversity and Inclusion, I am so excited and to work for a company like Dominion Energy that really believes um, that this is important and really recognizes that it has a culture that embraces um, diversity and inclusion. Um, as we continue to um, do these type of events and embrace the Hispanic community and our Hispanic businesses here in Virginia, um, we're really focused on not only clean energy, but to um, have a diverse workplace and also uh, be able to have a great relationship with diverse suppliers to really expand that area for us. So these type of events do such a great job for that. But thank you so much. No, thank you, Maria. And you know what, uh, since I started with the chamber, I always, I mean, when I started in 2014, I heard about Dominion having projects with the Virginia Hispanic Foundation. So I know that you guys have a long, a long story with the chamber and that you have being constantly supporting their projects and we thank you for for looking at us and for believing our projects and, and keep uh, supporting you know lisa's passport to education program or the virginia hispanic chamber the virginia Kenyan studies the virginia hispanic foundation so we thank you for your support and and that's for for companies or, or people like you we're able to do these uh, events with you to yeah um, and now i would like to move on to our next guest her name is jennifer rodriguez and i'm excited because I, the, the, she works for one of the brands that follow me through my whole life <laughs> so let me introduce her um she's an entrepreneurial minded leader with almost 10 years in consumer packaged goods industry jennifer is currently the director of commercial development for the global brands division at nestle the world's largest food and beverage company with over 90 billion revenue in 2020. In May of 2020, Jennifer graduated from Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business with her executive MBA. Jennifer's robust professional experience in less than 10 years is a testament to her work ethic, capabilities, and leadership style. Jennifer, we're very excited to have you here. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. And please share your personal story, including your path you follow to success and clues you notice along the way to be here with us. Great, well, thank you so much. First off, hello everyone, Jennifer Rodriguez. And that was quite the intro. So thank you, Sandra, thank you, Lisa. Thank you to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to join today's discussion. And as you guys just heard from Jeanette and Maria, I am honored to be selected amongst these ladies um, and, and share my personal story as well as learn from from them. And so with that, I want to start off by saying that I am a very proud first generation American. Um, my father is from Argentina and my mother is Portuguese, born and raised in Angola, Africa. And they both immigrated to the U.S. Uh, at about 25 years old and were set up on a blind date in the beautiful exotic state of New Jersey. And two years later, they got married and thought, this is exactly where we want to have children and raise our family. And so I am a Jersey girl at heart, um, but I am also very multicultural. Um, so I learned Portuguese, then Spanish or Castellano, then English in that order. And really, my brothers and I, my family, we were one of the few Hispanic families in a predominantly Italian American neighborhood. And so we did stick out. And I remember in, in growing up and going into different events at school thinking, I don't want my friends to hear me speak my languages because I'm going to, I'm going to stick out and I want to fit in and I want to blend in. And it was really my parents and the cultures, the values, the traditions that we had within our home 
that made me who I am today. And it was hard for me to realize that that was part of who I was. And it was hard through those growing up years, the adolescent years, my brothers and I, they helped make my skin tougher through all of that. Um, but as I was able to embrace myself authentically and who I was and be able to bring that to my everyday interactions and continue to, to work towards my dream, which was to be a businesswoman, to be a badass Latina businesswoman. That is really where everything started to come together. And so for me, I, you know, I am so honored and blessed to be celebrating my 10 year anniversary with Nestle this upcoming July. Um, I was recruited right out of undergraduate. And so I've had quite the, the career in the last 10 years in multiple roles, multiple functions. And I am currently the director of our global brands division, which is essentially the import and export arm of Nestle USA. Our mission is very simple. We wanna bring people a taste of their home. And as Sandra said, she recalls a Nestle brand that she grew up with with her whole life. I'm sure you all can relate. Mosa, La Lechera, Maggie, Nescafe. These are all brands that as you immigrate or leave your home country, there's, there's that feeling that is so special and unique to having that taste of home. And so I really, this has been a passion area of mine and I'm really enjoying leading the development and business strategy in this role with, with the organization. Um, on the personal side, I did graduate from Georgetown uh, McDonough School of Business with my executive MBA this past May. Um, so amidst the pandemic, amidst all of this, craziness. I was also part of those graduates, those poor graduates that had a virtual ceremony um, and that one day hopefully we can we can get back in person and, and truly celebrate. But again, I'm honored to be here today and I'm excited to, to learn more from each of my, my peers here as well as um, share more in the Q&A. Thank you, Jennifer. What a great story. And you know, what? as I was listening to all of you, I feel like the common denominator, denominator behind all of this one or family, the second uh, resilience. I hear all about struggles, um, challenges, and the community is resilient to move forward and you know achieve your goals. So that's that's really nice to hear from from all of you. With that, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Lisa, please go ahead and kick off the conversation. Thank, thank you, Sandra, and I totally agree. Um, it's so inspiring, I think, for, I know Sandra and I to hear the stories, but for everyone else uh, listening and tuning in, and also uh, for the students that we work with in the schools with the Pasaporte a la Educación programs, the bilingual leadership um, that we have for the students, because so many of them were just, they're just like you, that they, mm -hmm are having a struggle figuring it out and uh, the language and learning English. And, you know, I, I, the programs really help to like encourage them and inspire them to, to be like you. And, and so you're such great role models for all of them. Um, so I hope that they will be able to <laughs> uh, listen and tune in and, and be inspired by you all in the future. So our first question, uh, Jeanette, we'll let you start out and then um, we'll continue with Maria and then Jennifer. So the first question is, what are some better questions to ask yourself when you are faced with challenges in your business or career? So you, I, you know, I think we have, sometimes you, your brain is always asking you questions and sometimes you have to stop it and make it ask the right question so that you can point yourself in a better direction. So Jeanette, could you go ahead and um, maybe start it off for us? Sure, sure. You know, there's so many different challenges um, through a career, through owning a business that you face on a regular basis. Whether it's a big challenge or a small challenge, there's a couple of things I'll, I have to remind myself to do. One is to objectively look at the data. So you, you, you may have something that tugs at you emotionally, uh, maybe in a negative way or in a positive way. And if you 
allow those emotions to overshadow the actual data, you might make bad decisions, which are some of the lessons learned when you get to be my age. And so I really do try to take a deep breath, I, even though we can't help it sometimes when presented with a, a challenge or an opportunity to just kind of run with it and go with our gut and our intuition, which sometimes ends up being the right thing. I really do try to step back, look at the data. I also try to internalize, okay, why do I feel the way I do? What makes me feel this way? Because I do know that there are some things that have been very successful because of intuition. And I am a big note taker. So I will jot, jot, jot down all the different things, the pros and cons. I basically create the plus and deltas. And then I allow myself to sleep on it. Then the other thing I always try to do is bounce the ideas or my summary and my options to other people. I even play devil's advocate with myself. Like I will argue one point, then I'll argue the counterpoint just to make sure I'm looking at the different options. But I do find that if I take it to not just the executives, but sometimes other business people, professionals in my network, and sometimes even people who report several layers beneath me, just to kind of get their take. And it depends on the challenge, of course, of who the appropriate people are. I find that they may have a different perspective I didn't think of. So I try to be inclusive in making sure that I just don't run off with an idea without some collaboration and validation. Yeah, definitely. I, I totally relate to everything that you were saying. I do the same thing. I'll have the conversation with myself first. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Maria, how about you? Is there any like better questions you ask yourself whenever you're faced with those challenges within your career or business or you know the different areas of your life? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's great. I love what you said, Jeanette, too. Um, I think, you know, take a step back and listen to yourself, like really be able to try to be objective. Um, I always ask myself to, um, you know, is this, a, you know, depending what it is, is this a risk that I want to take? I mean, if you're right, really trying to figure out or you're working on a project or you're dealing with something and you know that is, you know, you can push the envelope, you know, because the idea is that good that you want to make sure that you are taking, you think, you know, this is a risk that I might want to think about taking. Um, as long as it's informed, that you're listening to others, that you're collaborating, you know, I, I think we need to um, be able to taking a risk is not negative. I mean, it's really thinking, if you're thinking through it, if you're really putting um, all the information on the table, like, like Jeanette said, look at the data and you really think that this is the right thing to do, um, I think it's, it's a really, it, it's important that you ask yourself, should I move forward in this direction? Um, and I, but I do think it's important that, you know, we are risk takers because that is where you're going to have those differences in your career. You're going to be able to, you know, stand out and you're all, all you know, not everyone's going to buy into your idea at first, but you really kind of take a risk. You bring people on board, you explain to them what they are, what it is. Um, you might really be able to move the needle and, and get them to understand where you're going and uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I, I, I know. And I think like sometimes uh, whenever it's, you need to accomplish something, so I found if I say, how can I get this done, that the how part of the question is what trips me up. If I say, who can I ask to help get this done or who can help get this done that, you know, like assigning a person, like sometimes that can guide me to, oh, okay, take, take the risk in that direction and, and move it forward differently. You know, just, just a simple change. Sometimes I felt like that, that's been something that's worked too. Thanks, Maria. Well, Jennifer, um, could you go ahead and let us know, like, are there are better questions that you've asked yourself um, when faced with like challenges that you've encountered um, through your career with Nestle 10 years? I mean, it's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think 
honestly, I, I totally agree with Jeanette and Maria on, on those points. Fact-based, data-based decision-making and calculated risks is more than ever um, happening in the business world, regardless of industry. It is has shifted. It's been a complete shift from relationship-based selling, relationship-based um, dealings with business to now everything is rooted in data and facts. And the more that could be quantitative and qualitative, but the more information you have, that is power, right? It's power for you, for yourself to be able to scenario plan and understand what is this risk? What happens if I do A, then B? C, then D, and have be able to play the devil's advocate. Jeanette, I loved your idea of the diversity of thought. Um, I always recommend mentors and selecting people within your network that have complete opposing views to yours. Because if you talk to someone who's just like you, they're going to tell you, I agree, that's a great idea, go do it. You want someone who's a different personality type. If you're extrovert, find that introvert. You want someone who's going to be able to bounce those ideas and really make you think about it in a different lens through a different perspective. That's going to bring more comfort in whatever decision you decide to take. Um, and I think the last piece too is really asking yourself, what do I have to lose? I, this idea of is the risk worth taking? Absolutely. The idea of fail fast and falling forward is real and it is where you're going to be the most uncomfortable, but that's where the most growth is. That's where you'll learn the most. And you will also get the exposure and the type of network that you need to help support you and bring you along the way. And the last thing I'll say on this is, you know, there's, there's this um, dichotomy of asking for help as a sign of weakness. That ends here. It is a sign of strength that showing vulnerability, showing who you are, what you know, what you don't know, and asking for help in those situations, that goes such a long way. And it'll only make you that much more effective as a leader in taking those risks and having a team that supports you and, and will be there with you along the journey. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think all of you, you know, made such great points for anyone that, you know, it, you're when you're questioning yourself and, and I, you know, the data, that's like a huge, huge piece of it where before it was relationship driven. Now there's so much data driven and that that's a big change, you know, for a lot of people who have been in business and had relationships and, you know, making that shift like that. And, and I think asking for help, like you said, asking for help and don't be afraid to ask for help because we, you know, it, we need everyone to assist us to help us learn and grow and in whatever needs there are when you're in business and moving forward in your career. So that, thank you so much for that. Well, Sandra, you want to go ahead and take the next question? Go ahead and ask. Okay, I'll start with Janet. Janet, the second question is, did you ever have a fear that you knew you had to face like uh, thinking what you were doing wouldn't work or if you if what you built will be taken out or away from underneath you? Well, the biggest challenge I faced, I faced fairly early in the um, company's growth. Uh, we were six years old, almost six years old when 9-11 hit. So I grew up in IT. You, you understand risk management. You understand disaster recovery. You understand a lot of elements that you can apply to business. Nobody could have predicted 9-11 and what that would mean to any company. That was probably the biggest um, challenge, even more so than the pandemic or the recession in 2008. I went from having... Um, Oh, you know, over 40 people, very high paying projects. And when I say high paying projects, these are hundreds of dollars per hour per person to from a 9-11 to December 1 down to eight people. That is that was worse than starting a business because I started a business with zero debt. I was self-funding and now I had, you know, fixed um, expenses. There were so many things that was just almost overwhelming. Um, I learned some things through there that I applied at the pandemic. One was um, making sure that if we didn't have the business not to hold on to people 
Now, we were very, very fortunate with the pandemic, but it was one of the things I kept in mind as we looked at this challenge with companies closing down. How is that affecting my clients? Would we, would we have that domino effect? So yes, um, there is that fear. That's, there is a constant fear when you own a business. Um, I don't have investors. You know, I, make, I have this, this responsibility in that no matter what, good or bad, um, I feel very responsible that I make good decisions because I feel that responsibility, not only of providing good jobs, but being able to allow people in over the 25 years of being in business to grow in their professional uh, career. And that's really, that, that drives me every day to continue to grow and be a sustainable enterprise so that can be generational. Now that's, uh... You know, that's, that's really true of when external events um, impact your company or your business. And I mean, it, it wasn't a decision that you took. It just be prepared and sometimes unexpected that as a leader, you have to be able to pivot and make sure that your employees are fine, that make sure that you are still able to provide. There's a lot of responsibility and, you know, I, I, I don't want to say a lot of stress too, <laughs> to make sure that you, know, you, you continue running your business the way the way it is. Yeah. I can relate to that, but I can imagine I, I the level Lisa. of responsibility. I knew Lisa at that time. And wow. um, I think I may have even shared with Lisa and her husband, there were nights mm -hmm. I would wake up, go in the living room and cry just because it was so overwhelming. Um, and my husband was a billable consultant uh, one of the eight left and we didn't take a paycheck for over a year because we needed those dollars to fund the company. So um, whether whether you're an executive or you're on, an entrepreneur, you do feel that um, obligation, that responsibility for other people and, and making sure that, you know, you keep things safe. That's what everyone, I know, if we in our, our realm when we'd be in DC and when we'd all get together. Um, I mean, there's so many great entrepreneurs and everyone with their companies and the, the great contracts everyone has always had. And, but like with you, Jeanette, I know, I know I saw you, I always saw you. And no matter what it was, you would rethink and you'd retool. I mean, that was like, and you would plow forward. And I always, admired that about you and I think that's like such a good takeaway and I'm so glad you like you shared those things because it's not always roses and and mm -hmm. an easy path and sometimes when people look at like oh where you are now what you built that or my gosh you know it it took it takes so much and it takes being that flexible person to change it up <laughs> when it's not working out and then thinking okay how can I do this differently you know, I know a lot of people are facing that right now with our business owners and, and you know, everyone um, that I've encountered is like trying to stay in business, you know, right now, trying to stay and rethink, how can I stay in business and what's it going to look like? You know, and, and, and like Jennifer said, take, you know, like you're taking that risk and you too, Maria, just go for it. Take the risk. Don't worry if it's perfect or not. Perfect's boring. Just go for it. Yes, I mean that's such a powerful message. Especially, I, I, I see that in our Let's Talk Business series, with it's basically for entrepreneurs and startups. Um, it's important they know that it's not always easy as it looks, but it's important to know the challenges and you know the the stress that can take up. But hey, nothing is impossible. It's just do your job, do the work. <laughs> now, Maria. Did you ever had a fear that you knew you had to face, like thinking what you were doing wouldn't work or if, if what you built within your career will be ripped up from underneath you? It's okay, Marie, um, you look like the, the, I see the, the light. odds yes. are shining down on you right now. <laughs> yes, I just realized that I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm going it's to okay. actually, um, <laughs> I can close this really yeah. like this. Okay, I'm so okay. sorry. There we go. No, no problem. Um, there we go. No, there, there you are. <laughs> I saw that and I was trying to. Uh... So um, yes, 
Um, definitely. Um, I, you know, I think in my career, the, um, the time for me, do, you know, I was in government, so um, was mainly around um, leaving the Bush administration. Um, my husband and I decided to move overseas, um, and it was more of um, a decision. We, we had this great opportunity to move to Germany for um, for him to go with his job. He works also for the federal government. And um, I left, um, you know, a, a high position at State Department to move overseas without really a job. I was fortunate enough to get a job at US Africa Command and I worked there for four, four and a half years. But, you know, we really thought about this as a time, you know, I was an older um, married couple, not really that old, but older. And unlike you, Jeanette, we didn't have children earlier on in our marriage. We had been married for six years. I was working at the White House, really, busy, you know, and, and the Bush administration. I just didn't see us having kids at that time. So we said, you know, this time in Germany would be the perfect time to, you know, maybe start a family. So I think for me that it was tough. Um, and, and I think a lot of women go through this, you know, when it's, if you want a career, um, if you're looking to pursue a career, when is that perfect time? And, and, and there's really no right answer to that question. Um, you know, there's many things you can do. There are options depending where you are in your career, but there's really no right answer on, you know, how do you have that work-life balance? And I think for me, um, you know, I really took uh, educated risk and said, you know, this is definitely going to, it, I'm in, I'm in the, at a very good place in my career trajectory, but this is probably going to, my career will take a hit right now due to the fact that I'm leaving the work, the United States and going to another country. But I said, you know, that's a risk that I'm willing to take. You know, I, I, I did all the pros and cons. I looked at, you know, and I just said, you know, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let time pass and see what happens. Because, you know, the family was something that, I, that both my husband and I wanted. And, you know, it, it, it worked out for us. I mean, well, we have two beautiful girls, which I wouldn't trade for the world. Um, they're amazing. And Jennifer, I would have to say, Unlike your parents, I speak to them in Spanish, but they are relentless fighting me. So I will have you be a great example for them. I'm going to tape, I'm going to play this to them and say, look at Jennifer. She's had a great example. Um, but, you know, we, you know, and, and I have a great career now and I'm very happy. And I think things, you know, I really never gave up. But, you know, it is, there are, especially, I think, for women that we have to make those decisions and we have to have that balance. When can I start a family? Is it going to affect my career? Is it not? Am I going to make whatever goal? Is it CEO? It's vice president? It's senior vice president? Or whatever your career goal is or your roadmap is, you have to decide where you that and, and, and I don't like to say it that way but it, it's true when can you take maternity leave when are you going to have time to raise your kids and I was fortunate enough to be able to take a little time about a year to be with my girls um, and my husband was deployed so that kind of helped um, and then just start you know my career back up again but um, I think for any woman out there that is um especially business owner that's kind of making that right, that decision or thinking about that right now, there's never going to be a right time. So just think it through, have your roadmap in place. And yeah, you'll, you'll stumble, you'll probably might fall, but you'll pick yourself back up and continue and shine at the end. That's a very wonderful thought, Maria, and message because a lot of us, we are like, when is this the good time to do this and that and that? And now, now that times are more, you know, careers are more demanding. Um, careers, I mean, we devote our early years to build a successful career, but then there is still the personal life section. Where do I fit in within that career path? So it's really important that you say, it's okay. And, you know, I, I think flow, 
So I, yeah, I agree. You know, and then yeah. like um, I, Michelle and I've been married 36 years, and so I've always had a career. I always wanted to be Lisa, but then we have three kids, and I had baby, baby, baby. You know, and so it was like, okay, how can I? make this all work. I've always, you know, been in the education field and an entrepreneur level too. So it was, I had to just always figure out how to make it work and, and blend it into my life. And because both, you know, being Lisa was important to me and, and having, having some, a career because I, I felt like I had that within me and then being mom too, it was like, I, I wanted to be a great mom, you know? And, and, and so I think, you know, not beating yourself up. It's however you can blend it and do it and, and just know that you are, you're doing a good job <laughs> and, and go with that. Yeah. And it's exciting to see that um, more girls, more, uh, you know, uh, at least in my family, all of us, we're, we're, we're studying, we're thinking about going to college. We're thinking, I mean, I passed college for my cousins, my nieces, they're thinking that's a, that's a yes or, or do you have to do it um and on the business and entrepreneur side it was amazing because i was just checking the data based upon registration and hey at some point last week i saw all women and i thought this is amazing so they all, they all sign up for the uh how to open a business and i, I told hector hector we have all women oh that's amazing just to see that they want to you know become business owners i thought that was very exciting um but now moving forward with jennifer jennifer i'll repeat the question and it's do you ever had a fear that you knew you had to face like think, thinking what you were doing wouldn't work or if what you built will be ripped out from underneath you what can you tell us about that yes and i'll, I'll build on this idea of it's never the right time i can totally relate to that personally and conversations that my family and I are having now. We have two fur babies, which you probably see there. Milo and Maggie are two rescue dogs named after Nestle brands. Um, and so, you know, I think for me, it's really the decision on whether or not I needed to go back to school to get my master's of business administration um, was one that I kept weighing out and, and over the course of my professional career, trying to find the right sign or the right time to say, this is when I'm gonna do it. It's going to be challenging. Probably the most challenging thing I do, work full time and then spend all of my weekend time in a classroom um, dedicate all of my free time back to school, as well as the sacrifices that a family needs to understand, my husband and my family as well, not being able to be there for every holiday or birthday and things like that. And so I ultimately, um, it, that moment never happened, right? It was just I've got, I've got to do this. This is something for me personally. I know I've wanted to go back to school. I'm not going to have that clarity I'm looking for. I need to just take the risk and I need to just run towards the fire. And now after graduation, two and a half years in that program, it was one of the most challenging things I've ever experienced, but I am so much stronger because of it. Um, there were times throughout the program where I, I wanted to quit. I'd come home and say, you know, I don't think I, I can do this. I don't think I, I think I need to maybe take a break from work and just focus on school. I want to be a top performer and I feel like I'm falling short in both. And I really just had to take a step back, tap into my network, talk to those people that think opposite of me and say, your competition is always with yourself and you are your own worst enemy. Give yourself a little bit of grace. And That's that was really, such a big learning for me. I'm sorry, Sandra, that was pause okay. for, for drama, right? Um, it was such a great learning moment for me because I was very much, I needed to learn that. And it, it came with its hardship, but it was such a great learning. That's, that's wonderful. Actually, you answered my, I was gonna ask you a following question. What made you stay? What made you say, no, I have to continue? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it was just that twist. It was just looking mm -hmm. at it from a different lens, thinking, you know, I might have a week where I need to give 150% to work and I might be 50% at school, but that's why I have a team around me to help 
bring this project to life, carry us forward. That's why you work in teams. That's really what it comes down to is the people, your support system, and just being open and transparent and asking for that help when you need it. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think it's a, a, a something to learn to say yes to you. You know, I, I, I think a lot of times we give, you know, as women, you know, you give to your family, your spouse, your, you know, you, you give and to take, to say yes to you can be a big deal. And it's not being selfish, it's self care and saying yes to you, to, to you, because the world, the world's waiting for you. That, that's how I look at it. All of us have these great talents within us and the world's waiting for us because it, we're, we're here to make a difference. And that's what, that's what you did. You said yes to you. And I, I think that that's just wonderful. It really is amazing. You know, to, and when it was hard, you just, you know, you push past, you push past. Yeah. I think that's a hard part whenever you feel like you reach a ceiling and you think, oh, I can't, you know, I, something's got to go. But there's always that other way. There's always that way to figure that other thing out. And then you push past it. The, Keep pushing the, through. Mm -hmm. Keep running towards the fire. Push through. You will get to the other side. And again, you will learn so much from it. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. Yep. Thanks for that. Uh, well, we have a third question. So um, Jeanette, start us off with this one. And then Maria and then Jennifer. What's one lesson you learned from your career through mistakes? So I think we were talking about before we started how mistakes are not mistakes. They're basically just life's lessons. You know, you're learning. It's a learning. That's all. And so how about you, Jeanette? Like, is there something you learned um, through mistakes? Well, I will tell you, there is a mistake that I, I tend to do. Um, I had a mentor who is the person that actually gave me this line and I have to always check myself earlier. We talked about, you know, when you have risks or, or challenges, I always have to check myself with this one. And it is do not hire fast mm. or fire slow. Mm. And I had the tendency of hiring fast because my intuition about <laughs> someone and what their experience is, it's like, I, I, I like them or whatever, that if they're not a good fit, I had the tendency of firing slow. So do the exact opposite hire slow, fire fast. That, that is a lesson I've learned as I've gotten older. I've got a little more patient with myself and not having to rush things. But the people that are part of your team are so important that you and they deserve the time that it takes to make sure that it's a good match. That's really good. <laughs> I, I think that's something a lot of us need to remember, especially um, if, if you're an entrepreneur, you have, you're in charge of a team. That's super, super, super. Anybody, important. you can be a small business. You can be a, an executive. It doesn't really matter when you are paying somebody to, to fulfill a purpose. You've got to do more than just like them or think they have a great personality, which I, I had a tendency previously. And I still do. And I, I, there are people where, again, with facing it when you're do, going after a key hire, or even if it's not a key hire, there's nothing worse than firing somebody just because there's nothing wrong with them. They're just not a fit for the position, you know? And so it, it really avoids a lot of mistakes and emotional tugs um, if you take the time. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Maria, how about you? So one lesson like you've learned through your career, through oh. a learning experience or mistake? <laughs> Um, oh, many lessons <laughs> that I've learned in my career. Um, let's see one that sticks out for me. And I think Jennifer kind of alluded to this. Um, I always, I took a leadership course and they talked about building your own personal board of directors. Um, and, you know, to me, a board of directors are those people that kind of push the, push you and say, look, are you doing the right thing? Asking those tough questions and not necessarily agreeing with you and everything you do. And throughout my career, I've always had, and, and that list has grown. Um, you know, the group of people has grown or has, you know, evolved through the time, but have those people in your network that you really want to rely on 
that you can confide in, that you can really have those tough discussions about, am I doing the right thing? I made this mistake. What, you know, I'm trying, you know, I want to learn from it more. What do you think? I mean, just being honest and transparent and help having them help you guide your path. And I think one of the lessons that I've learned is that you're not in this journey on your own. Um, it's your family, it's your colleagues, it's your, you know, your team. I mean, you are, you know, you are taking all of these people with throughout your career journey, your kids, because if you're unhappy at work every day, you don't like what you do, you're going to bring it home. So as you really have go through this journey, make sure you have a great group of people, not only your family, but a professional, you know, board of directors, they will always be there for you that you can rely on to really have those, you know, hard discussions with them and yourself. Um, are you doing the right thing? Or are you not? And I think that's been one of the things that I've learned through many, you know, things that have happened throughout my career. Um, anytime I stumble, I always go to them or to several of them and say, hey, you know, what can I do better? What are your thoughts? Just to keep me engaged, focused, and adaptable, and, you know, to be able to help me move forward as well. Yeah, I, I, I really relate to that. I have a, a group that I meet with. In fact, um, they're an international group. So they're in Australia and Canada and, <laughs> and they're all business entrepreneurs and owners. And um, we meet once a week. We did this for a while and they give a different perspective for me. And sometimes it's not what I want to hear, but I need to hear. <laughs> so, you know, and I think that's really helpful. And even, I'm just going to say, um, my, with just my immediate family, my husband thinks different from me. We have the same values and beliefs, but wow, like we have so different, different ways of thinking and approaching things, but it's kind of cool because we can present something to each other and then it makes each of us think of it totally different. And then, and then we can move move forward in a different way. So I, I think that's, yeah, that's like really, really helpful. Thank you. So um, Jennifer, um, how about you? Something you've learned from your career through mistakes? Yeah, I, I told, there's so many, right? There are so many. If you are not constantly making mistakes, you are not taking enough risks, bottom line, right? So there's so many to choose from, but I will I will share, um, you know, the, the similar thought of this board of directors, your network, um, and really kind of pull the thread on feedback. Um, and someone giving critical feedback is really a gift if you are open to hearing it, receiving it, and then acting on it. It truly is a gift. Um, it, takes, it takes courage to put your ego aside and really be open to implementing those changes and changing that. But that was a, a, a something that I have continued to view as a gift and take at very openly. And in early on in my career, I was given the feedback that sometimes in my approach, I was very direct, too, too direct, quite frankly. I was too aggressive and I came off as maybe all business and not enough of that human element, not enough of that human connection. And I think it had to be, do a little bit with my Jersey side and maybe some Latina, but that's besides the point. Um, and I was given that feedback and I thought, okay, how can I start working on this? And it really comes down to putting myself in someone else's shoes and being an empathetic leader. And I'm still on that journey of empathy. I'm still on that journey of trying to, to have that human connect, connection and really it comes down to people will forget what you say, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that's really at its core, um, a, a, one of the biggest learnings and one of those biggest mistakes that I made. And I'm so glad someone had the courage to approach me, give me that feedback. And I'm so glad I was able to make that change. Yeah, I say that all the time too. People remember how you make them feel. And it's so true. Exactly. So thank you. I, all of this was so wonderful today. 
I mean, it touched my heart and I know, and get, and I, I took notes. <laughs> I was like, wow, I love so many things that I heard. So, um, Sandra, I'll pass it over to you right now. Well, Lisa, you touched base on it. Um, with this, we finalized our presentation, but before we go, I would like to, and before I thank you, I would like to um, ask everyone or each of you, if you would like to share a message with the audience, is there anything that you'd like to tell a college student, entrepreneur, or someone that's in your same path building a career? And we'll start with Janet. <laughs> I always have to be the first one, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's okay. Um, it's age before beauty, right? <laughs> oh, that's right. I like that. You know what? Every single day I wake up and pray that I can be the best person that I can be. I am, I, I have a life that I, my mother and father would never have dreamed of. And so for those in the audience, just be the best that you can be. I have so much gratitude for the people who have helped me get to where I am and, and being thankful for that um, adds so much to just having a life that feels, that feels fulfilled. That's, that's wonderful. Maria? Jeanette, I love that. Um, I agree with Jeanette. I mean, I am, I feel um, incredibly grateful and blessed every day um, for having to, to be where I am today. I mean, from a, you know, a girl that came to the United States at eight years old from Argentina, and we really didn't have much to, you know, what I've been able to accomplish with the help of, you know, when they say it takes a village, it does, with help of so many amazing people along the way. Um, I'm just incredibly grateful. And I think it's important that any, you know, people that are watching that find themselves in a situation, because it is, this year has been challenging and tough, and we've all faced it, you know, in an emotional perspective and work for some of us, you know, um, and, and I've been fortunate that I've had um, a job that I can work from home, but some people are not in that uh, predicament. Um, so the challenge is gonna pass. And, you know, we've all, we've talked about obstacles. We've talked about challenges. Um, we can learn from those. Um, you can overcome those. And, you know, we are an amazing community of very strong, uh, individuals that make the Hispanic community in the United States in this amazing country that we live in. And if you, we can accomplish something, we can accomplish it here. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for this country for, for what it has given me and my family. And um, I can just, I think my message in short is you can do it. Um, you can make it. It's going to be, sometimes it's a tough road, but you know, there's always something great at the end. That's, that's, that's so true. I mean, it, this is a country of opportunities and we encourage the audience to take advantage of, of the good things that Virginia and all the states offer. Um, Jennifer, is there something that you would like to share with the audience? Yes, and I, I think Jeanette and Maria, it's been an honor to just, because I don't think I'll have another opportunity. So thank you so much for sharing your stories and giving us a pr new perspective. I've learned so much. I myself was writing down notes, so thank you. Um, I would say to the audience, be a student of life. Continue to approach every cha challenge that comes your way from an opportunity to learn. What can I learn from this? What is life teaching me? What can I gain from it? If you approach that every challenge obstacle with a sense of curiosity, asking yourself the questions, thinking through the greater picture of what can you gain from any situation, it'll give you that silver lining that we all so need right now. So continue to be a student of life, to continue to ask questions and continue to ask for help and lean on your support network. You will push through, this will be past us and we'll continue to learn life together. Wonderful. Um, I, I agree with that, Jennifer. I mean, we, we have to look for ways to keep going and, and try. 
And with that, I would like to thank you, uh, Maria, Jennifer, and Janet for being here with us today. We appreciate you all for sharing your story, your challenges, and your successes. Um, from my side, that's all. Lisa, yeah. would you like to say something? Thank you from my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate all of you taking the time to do this, to be here to share your stories, um, just to be your honest, vulnerable, authentic self. So, muchísimas gracias. Thank you.